Hey everyone, thanks for joining Learn to Play Games. My name is Lance, and in today's video I'm going to teach you how to play Tiny Ninja Heroes. This is a new game by Tooniverse. It is a 1-2 to two player game that takes roughly half an hour to 45 minutes to play, and is a competitive 1 versus 1 or solo game depending upon the mode you've selected to play. So in the video I'm going to teach you how to play the 1 versus 1 mode first, as the rule set for this is very important, even if you want to play the solo mode, you will need to know the rules for this. So with this one, I'm going to start off with components, setup, player turn, and endgame conditions. From there, about halfway through the video, we'll switch over to the apocalypse mode or solo mode, and I'll teach you how to play that, starting with setup, player turn, endgame conditions, and finally scoring. As always, if you find these videos helpful, if you like what I do, please consider that like button subscribing to my channel. It's one of the easiest ways you can support channels like mine so I can continue to grow and be able to produce this content. If you want to stay in on my videos, also consider that bell so you get notifications anytime we release new stuff. So let's head to the table, and I'll teach you how to play. There are three different types of dice included in the game. The first is a d4 with numbers 1 to 4 on it, and this will be used in the Apocalypse game. Next is a d6, which has one numbers 1 to 6 on it, and will also be used in the Apocalypse game. The final die is the Tiny Ninja die, or TN die, and this, as you can see on the chart, has three different ways it can be used. First, the number of throwing daggers that are shown on the face, which will be 1, 2, or 3 values. Next is the background color, which is going to either be white or black, and three of the sides will have white and three will have black. Finally, the color of the throwing dagger and perimeter around the background, which will either be orange, green, or purple. Next is the item deck, and this deck is going to be comprised of all different types of cards that will help you throughout the game. Each one of these cards will list the cost to play that card and energy points, along with the card's name and its rarity or number of times that you'll find that card in the item deck. Finally, at the bottom of the card is the effect of the card that is going to be resolved when you play it, and each one of these cards is a single use. Some cards, such as the Power Scroll, will also list a variable cost depending upon if you're playing a solo apocalypse game or a one versus one game. And these cards will have all kinds of different effects, including gaining additional energy points, giving you a shield, destroying fog, or adding damage to your next attack, and all kinds of other effects. Each player is going to control a team of four ninja, which will include the Panda, Master, Archer, and Solo. Each ninja is also going to have their own custom health die that is going to keep track of their current health. And as they take damage, they're going to readjust that die to the new value. There are two different sets of dice that are included in the game. With this, you'll have one set that'll have the Panda and Solo on it, and the other set will have the Master and the Archer on it. Moving over to the character cards, each character's card will list the name of that ninja, along with their starting health, and each ninja is going to have two abilities. Each ability will list the name of that ability, as well as the type of ability it is, and there are three different types. We'll have attack abilities, defense abilities, and support abilities, and there'll be certain points during each round that players can activate those abilities. On the other side, you'll have a number of energy points that you have to spend to use that ability, and then the effect of that ability, and I'll go into more detail about this a little bit later in the video. Each player is also going to have a hero on their team, and the hero is the most important part of the team. If a player's hero is ever eliminated, the game is over immediately, and that player has lost. Each hero's card is going to list the name of that hero on the top, along with their starting number of hit points. Each hero also has two skills, and at the bottom of their card is going to be a special perk that is unique to that particular hero. And each of the perks is going to outline how it works, but it is not going to cost an action to use that perk. For example, with Legends, when he makes a slash or shockwave attack, he's also going to do his rampage, which depending upon what he rolls, he might be able to add an additional damage to the attack that he's performing. From there, let's go ahead and move into setup. So first off, place the main game board out in the middle of the table so that both players can reach it. From there, then you want to grab the items box and item deck. Go ahead and shuffle that up and place it in half of the box. The other half will be used for the discard pile. And you want to place that so that both players can reach it. You also want to grab and place out the TN die, and then you're going to randomly determine which player is going to be the starting player. And you can do this in any manner you want to, or you can roll a die if you're unable to determine that. From there, then each player is going to receive their team of ninja, so our starting player will be on uh, the left-hand side, and they will receive their starting four ninja. Each player will also receive a quick reference guide for the round, and they will get their four health dice that they're going to go ahead and set in front of each one of their characters. The first player will have their blue marker on the zero spots for their energy points, and the second player or red player will receive one energy point. 
The first, the blue player will be the attacking player, and the red player will be the defending player during the first round. Next, each player is going to choose a hero for their team. You can do this in any manner you want to again, randomizing it or having the first player choose first or however you want to do it. From there then the players are going to choose, so our first player will take Legends, and his opponent will also receive a card for that to reference that throughout the game, and he will receive the die. Then next the other player will choose, and they're going to take Turtle. And that player will get the die, and this player will also get the reference card for that. From there then each player is going to receive two potion cards and then starting with the first player it's going to alternate going back and forth with each player choosing one of their ninja to place out on their starting side of the board which is going to be the first three columns on their half of the board. So the blue team will use these first three and the red team will use these first three columns. So starting with the blue player that player is going to choose one of their ninja to place out so I'm going to go ahead and place panda and I'll place him over here. Next, it'll move over to the red player to do the same. So the red player is going to place their archer in the back there. Moving back over to our starting player, that player is going to place solo out there. Over to the other team, they're gonna place their master on that side. Actually, let's go ahead and put him up here. From there, back over to blue to go. So blue is going to place their master up here. Over to red. Red will place Panda over here. Back over to Blue to go. Blue is going to go ahead and place the Archer there. Back to Red to place out their character. We'll go ahead and do that. Over to Blue to place out their hero. And again, you can do this in any order you want to. If you want to place your hero out before this, you can do so. I'm going to place mine back there and back over to red to finish theirs off. They're going to place turtle over there. The final step, each player is going to receive four shield tokens. Three of these will go in, the, in each player's shield storage section at the top of the board. And then each player will start with one shield in one of their four rows that they can place. So my player, my blue player will place theirs there. And my red player is going to place their shield here. Tiny Ninjas is played over an undefined number of rounds. Each round, the players, one player will be the attacker and the other player will be the defender. And then this is going to alternate during the next round. For example, during the first round, the blue player will be the attacker and the red player will be the defender. During the next round, the red player will be the attacker and then the blue player will be the defender. This is going to continue going back and forth during each round until one of the players is able to eliminate the other player's hero. At that point, the game is going to immediately end, and the player that was able to defeat their opponent's hero is going to be the winner of the game. Each round has five phases, which are going to be done in order, which include the income, movement, action, attack, and defend. I'm going to take you through each one of these in more detail, so you can see how they work. The first phase in each round is the income phase. During this phase, only the attacking player will gain these benefits. First off, the player is going to gain 1 energy point, up to a maximum of 5 energy points. If a player is already at their max, then they simply will not gain an energy point during this round. Next, that player will get to draw 1 item card from the item deck and add it to their hands. You want to keep these hidden from the other player so they don't know what you have. There is no hand limit to the items, and if you ever run out of items in the item deck to draw, simply shuffle the discard pile and then go ahead and draw. One important note with this, with the potions, they are not going to be reshuffled back into a new item deck. These will have the red backs on them and simply are going to be removed from the game once they're used by the players. The second phase in the round is the movement phase. During this phase, the attacking player will receive three movement points that they can spend to move their ninja around the board. They can spend all of the movement points on one ninja or separate them and use them on multiple ninja. Each movement point will allow you to move your ninja one space in one of the cardinal directions or in a straight line. You can also use two movement points to move diagonally. A couple important things with this is that you are not allowed to move into spaces with other ninja, both friendly and enemy, as well as you cannot move through them. So if Legend here used two movement points, he could not move into this space because there's a ninja in that space. Now with diagonal movement, you are allowed to spend two movement points to move diagonally, so Linjid could use two movement points to move into that space there. Again, you can move multiple ninja with those points or use all of your points to move one ninja. So in this example, let's go ahead and say that we are going to move Solo forward one space. I'm gonna go ahead and move Panda forward one space. 
and I will move legend forward one space. Now, one important thing to note is that movement points, if you do not use them during this phase, then they are simply lost. You will not be able to save movement points for use in later turns. The third phase in the round is the action phase. During this phase, the attacking player will receive three action points that they can spend to do a variety of different actions. These are optional, and a player can choose not to perform any or all of their actions during this phase, but any actions they choose not to perform are going to be lost at the end of this phase. There are four different options a player has as an action, and each one will cost one action point. A player can do that action any number of times, up to the maximum number of action points that they have for the round. The first option is to buy a shield. In order to do this, you're going to spend two energy points and then take a shield and place it in one of the rows that you do not currently have a shield, as each row can only have one shield. The second option you have is to discard two item cards from your hand to gain one energy point. The third option is to use an item or potion you have in your hand. If it has an EP cost, you must spend that in order to carry out the action that's listed on the card. From there, then you're going to discard the card to the discard pile. And the final option is to use a support ability, which is any ability with a star. If it has an EP cost, you must spend that in order to carry out the ability, and then you'll resolve its effect. Let's look at an example of this. The blue player is the attacking player for this turn, and so will receive three action points. So let's start off by using Solo's Blink ability, and this ability does not cost any EP points, so this will allow us to trade places with another ally ninja. So let's go ahead and switch with Legend and move him up here. So that is my first action. At this point, I don't have enough energy points to purchase a shield, and I don't really want to discard any cards from my hand to gain any more energy points, and I don't have any cards in my hand that I currently would like to use. So at this point, I'm going to end my action phase and move on to the next phase. The fourth phase in the round is the attack phase. During this phase, the attacking player can select one of their ninja and carry out one of their attack abilities, which is any ability that has the sword icon next to it. From there, then the ability itself is going to be broken down, so let's go ahead and cover that real quick. So as you can see here, the first icon on there is going to be the targeting directions of that ability and the range of that ability, which is going to list either a number of spaces or an F, which means that it can be any number of spaces. So for example, with the master, he can target any one of the, the adjacent spaces around him one space away. So again, any of these spaces could be targeted. From there, the bottom part of the description is going to tell you how many targets he can do. So for example, with this one, he is going to deal a number of damage to one direction. So we must choose our direction before rolling. And then some of the abilities are also going to have a cost in EP that we must spend in order to carry out that ability. So in the example that we have here, I am definitely going to activate Legend. His ability Slash is going to cost us 1 EP as we do not have enough for Shockwave. So we're going to go ahead and spend that in order to carry out Slash. From there, Slash can only target the cardinal direction, so in front of him, behind him, and to his left and right. And so we're going to have to choose our target, so we're going to go ahead and choose the space in front of him, which has the enemy master in it. As it is only a range of one, we can only target one space away. You can never target through enemies. So even if this attack would have had a range of two, we would not have been able to hit solo as he is in front or behind another ninja. From there, it's going to tell us what we're going to do. So this one is going to deal a certain number of damage in one direction. So again, it's going to be the master. And then we have to roll the T and die to determine the amount of damage that we do. With this one, we are going to look for either a white result, which will do one damage, or a black result, which will do two. So let's go ahead and roll and see what we get. It is a black result, so we will do two damage to the master. Now, Legend also has a perk that's going to activate, which is Rampage. This is going to add potentially additional damage based on what we roll. So let's go ahead and roll the die again and see if we get that. We're looking for the three daggers to come up, and if we do, we'll get a, a bonus damage. It did not, so we're simply going to do the two damage to the master. From there, at this point, now that damage is determined, it'll move over to the defending player to take out the final phase of this round, which is the defend phase. During this phase, if the attacking player was successful in dealing damage, then the defending player has an option to try to reduce that damage. 
The defending player, if they're in a row that has a shield, can choose to spend that shield to try to negate some of that damage. And you'll find a reference on the back of your quick reference guide to that, where you will roll the die based on either a white or black result. You'll remove one or two damage, and then you'd remove that shield. So if our shield was over here, we could choose to remove that, adding it back to our supply, and then roll the die. We rolled a black result, so we would have blocked both those points of damage and negated any damage to the master. Otherwise, if the character that's being targeted has a defend ability, they can carry that out if they wish, or if they have an ally that can use a defend ability to help them out, such as Panda, if he's adjacent to the target and he spends one EP point, he could take that damage in instead of the target. So if Panda was over here, he could choose to spend one of his energy points and take the damage for the master. But he is not, so the master will have to take two damage. So we're going to go ahead and adjust that value there. So the master only has two hit points left. If a uh, ninja ever runs out of hit points, then they are going to be removed from the game and placed back on their player board. Now that we've resolved the five steps in a round, this round comes to an end and the players will switch roles. So now the red player is going to be the attacker and the blue player will be the defender. So at this point, let me go ahead and take you through one more round to show you one more full example of this. So moving over to the red player, that player is going to gain an energy point and they're going to get to draw a new item card. So we have the shield, so that's going to be handy. From there, then we'll move into the second phase where our player is going to go ahead and move. They're going to gain three movement points. So my player over here is going to move the panda forward two spaces, and I will, I think, move my archer over one space. From there, then we'll move into the third phase, which is the action phase. So I'm going to go ahead and spend this shield to gain an additional shield token. So I'm going to go ahead and add that to one of the spaces that doesn't have a shield currently. So I'm going to go ahead and throw it into this space here. I think that's all I'm going to do for now with that. So then from there, then we'll go ahead and move into the attack phase. So I'm going to go ahead and use the staff on the panda. This one lets me attack in any one of the directions up to two spaces away. So I'm going to go ahead and tar target the solo on the other player. This attack does one damage to in one direction, and there is no roll required. So it's simply going to deal one damage to solo. From there, then it'll move over to the blue player to make a defend option. So that player does not have any EP or any shields to spend there to help with that. And he is out of EP, so he could not trigger Panda's bear hug ability either. So from there, then Solo is going to take one wound. And Solo does not have any additional hit points, so he has been eliminated from the blue player. At this point, then again, that round will end, and it will move back over where the blue player will be the attacking player, and the red player will be the defending player. And again, this is going to continue going until one of the players is able to eliminate the other player's hero. At that point, then the game will be over, and the player that eliminated the other player's hero will be the winner of the game. At this point, that is all the rules for the one versus one game. Now, there are some additional advanced rules in the back of the rulebook that I won't be covering here that'll add some more variety to the game once you've experienced everything and you want some new challenges. At this point, for the rest of the video, I am going to be covering the solo game Apocalypse. So if you want to check out and learn how to play that game, at this point, that's where we're going to be covering. If not, if you have any questions or comments, post those in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer them. And as always, thank you so much for taking the time to watch my video. So let's go ahead and head in to the Apocalypse version and see how this plays solo. Moving into setup, let's go ahead and start with the solo player. So that player is always going to be playing the blue ninja team. You'll select one hero and you'll gain two potions and your shield token as usual. You'll set the rest on the side and you'll start the game with one energy point. From there, let's go ahead and move over to the zombie team, which is always going to be played by the red tokens. And you are going to control this as well. First off, we have to deploy the zombie team. And in order to do that, first off, let's go over the board. So the board is going to be broken down into the top spaces here going across the top are going to be the black spaces. The bottom will be the white spaces. And the rows or columns are going to be numbered 1, 2, 3, and 4. This is going to be important when spawning the zombies. So first off, we're going to go ahead and start with Solo and work our way down to Panda. 
In order to do that, we're going to roll the d4, which is going to determine the column that this zombie is in, and the TN die, which is going to determine the side, whether it is down at the bottom with the white or at the top with black. So starting with Solo, he is going to be placed in column 3 on the black side, so he'll be up at the top here. Now, one important thing to note when deploying zombies is, and this will be true throughout the rest of the game as well, anytime you have to deploy a zombie in a space that already contains a zombie, you'll push that zombie forward one space. So, for example, if I roll that same result with the archer, I would move the ninja forward one space and place her in that column. Then, if, for example, you have to do this with a hero, so let's go ahead and say that the panda's down here, and we would have rolled a white result for the archer, she would not be able to be placed there, and we must re-roll our results. In this way, you can block zombies from coming out to certain locations. So moving back over to spawning, we're going to go ahead and spawn the archer next. She's column one on white side, so she'll be down here. Over to the master. He is white's three, so he is going to be down here. And finally, panda. Panda is going to be in column two on the black side. From there, then it's going to move back over to the solo player who is going to deploy their ninja in the three sections in the middle of the board in any way that that player wants to. At that point, then I'll also choose the column I wish to have the shield start off in, so I'm going to go ahead and place that over here. Apocalypse is played over an undefined number of rounds, and during each round, the player is going to go through the nine phases in order. This is going to continue round after round until the player's hero has been eliminated. At that point, the player is going to enter into a final scoring step where they're going to total up the, the number of points that they have for the game and compare it to the chart to find out if they're just a novice beginning their adventures or if they are going to be named among the ranks of the immortals. The first phase in the round is the spawn roll. This phase is going to be skipped if all four of the zombie ninja are out. But in later rounds, you are going to defeat those ninja, so if at the beginning of a round all four of the zombie ninja are not out, you're going to go through a respawn step where you're going to roll the d4 and tn die again to deploy those ninja. The second phase in the round is the zombie roll. In this phase, you're going to roll all three of the dice to determine the zombie that's going to activate, the type of attack it's going to do, and the placement of the fog tokens. So let's go ahead and roll. First off, let's go ahead and handle the fog tokens. So we rolled a two on the fog dice, consulting the fog chart, as you can see here. The number two result is going to have us place fog cubes in columns one and three. And these are going to give the zombie ninja a reduction in damage for the rest of this round by one point. Now you're always going to place both fog cubes out, even if you were able to remove fog cubes in the previous round. From there, then we're going to consult the other two dice. So first off, the D4 is going to tell us which ninja is going to activate, which we rolled a 1. So our solo ninja is going to activate for the zombies. And we rolled the 2 on there. So with that result, he is going to do 1 damage to in one direction. All right, so now we know what kind of attack he's going to do. The third phase in the round is the zombie attack. During this phase, the zombie that was activated based on the die is going to gain three movement points that it's going to use to move as close as it possibly can to its target. And there is going to be a priority that the zombie is going to go after, as well as objectives that the zombie is trying to meet to determine the target that it's going to go after. So I'm going to take you through each one of these. So first off, Solo is the zombie that has been activated due to the die. And so first off, we have to determine, based on his movement, which of the ninja he can attack. So he can get to Solo, as he can move forward, and that'll put him in range of Solo. He could move over to one of these spaces to be able to target the Master. One, two, and three, he won't be able to target Panda, but he can target the Master. So that are the three different options for the ninja that he can attack. From there, then we're going to move on to the second one, which is going to be unshielded ninja. So right now our shield is here, so our solo ninja is shielded. So from there, he would fall into one of those two that he could potentially go after. Finally is fog. The zombies are always going to want to try to stay within the fog lanes if possible, but they will leave a fog lane in order to target a higher priority ninja. Finally, the priority is the solo ninja, then the archer, 
finally the hero, Master and Panda. So obviously, out of the two that he has options of, Solo is higher on the priority than the Master or than the hero is. But due to the fact that the hero is not shielded, he is going to go after the hero instead. So he's going to move one, two, and three to place him within his attack distance of the hero. Finally, then we'll resolve the attack. So he is going to deal one damage to the hero, and then it'll move into our part of the phase, which is step four. This is defense, using shields and or defend abilities, if we have any. So I do have a defend ability on the panda. I could do a bear hug to take that damage instead of having legend take it. But I think right now I'm okay with that. So legend will take one damage. And then from there, it's going to move into step five, which is going to be our income step. During this, this is a little bit different than the, the regular game where we have to choose. We can either gain an item or we can gain an energy point. So with my character, I think I'm going to choose to gain an item this turn. So I have some Shuriken. So with them, they can destroy two fog or one enemy shield. So that's pretty handy. After I've done that, then I'll move into step or phase six where I gain three movement points where I can actually move my ninjas around. So with that, let's go ahead and, hmm, what do I want to do here? I'll go ahead and move Panda, one, two, over to there. Move my hero over one. All right, from there, and now at this point, then I'm going to move into my action phase where I'm going to gain uh, three actions that I could use to do various abilities. With that, I'm going to choose not to perform any actions this turn, but it's exactly the same as the base game. The eighth step is resolving an attack ability. So I can choose an ability on one of my ninjas to carry out at this point. So with that, I have Panda. I could do the staff to hit the archer for one, but she is in a fog lane, so she would reduce any damage that I deal to her by one point. So that is not going to help me. I could attack the master with the panda as well but again he is in a fog lane so i think with that i am going to end up going with the master instead so he can target a ninja that's adjacent to him so he could go after the solo ninja who is not in a fog lane and i would roll and resolve the the results on that so i am going to do one point of damage to him which is going to be enough to eliminate him so i'll go ahead and remove him and i'll add one token to his side saying that I have killed one of the solo ninjas. At this point now I've resolved the attack and again the fog is going to reduce any damage which is step nine where I would reduce that damage by one. So at this point that is the end of the round and so we would go ahead and start a new round. So let's go ahead and take a look at one more example of this. So again starting at the top of the round I, I do have a zombie that has not or that is out, so I'm going to go ahead and respawn that zombie back in. So it's going to be in column two on the black side, so it is actually going to move Panda forward one space. From there, then I'll go ahead and move into the second step where I'm going to do the zombie roll. It is going to activate the archer. I'm going to move my fog to three, so it's going to move from to one and four. And she is going to be able to activate doing two damage to her target in one direction. From there, then she's going to move. So she's going to try to move within range of her targets. So she can move one, two, three. So that'll put her in range of the ma or the hero. She could target the panda, and that is it. So out of those two, she is going to target the one that isn't shielded, which neither one of them is shielded. And finally, she's going to try to stay in the fog lane. So she is going to move forward instead of moving over here. And she will choose the hero as he is higher on the priority list than the panda. At that point, then she will go ahead and carry out her attack action, which is going to do two damage to our hero. And then I can use shield abilities and or defense abilities if I have them. So with Panda, I can choose to do that. I am going to do that this time as I don't really want my hero taking two more damage. So I can defend an ally from being attacked in a space that's adjacent to Panda. And I'll take the damage on him instead. So he'll drop down to three hit points from there. 
After that, now it's into my part of the turn, so I'm going to gain either an energy point or an item again. So I think this time I'm going to gain an energy point. From there, then I move into my movement phase where I get to move around the board. So let's go ahead and I will move, move Panda over. I'm going to move my Archer over one. And... I will move my master up one. From there, then it's going to move into my action phase where I get to perform up to three actions. So I'm going to go ahead and swap places with my master and solo using his ability, which lets him trade with an ally. I think I will. Do I want? I don't think I want to use a potion just yet. And I don't have anything else I want to do at the moment, so then I will move into my attack part of the turn. So I'm going to go ahead and use the Archer's Arrow ability. That has a range of three, so I'm going to go ahead and target the Master down here as he is not in a fog lane. And I'm going to deal a certain number of damage, so I have to roll the die and see what I get. And I got a green result, so it's one damage to the Master, so we're going to reduce his die down by one. And then we would start a new round. And the final thing I want to take you through is scoring. So once your hero has been eliminated, the game is over, and you're going to determine your final score with that. So there's a chart that you'll find here, as you can see on the side here as well. First off, let's go ahead and start at the top. So we get one point per remaining energy point that I have. So I have three points remaining there. So I'll add three points to my score. Next, I gain one point per item card that I had, so I have two more there, so I'm up to five points now. Then I get one point for each damage on the zombies that are remaining that I've done to them, so with the panda, I get two points. With the master, I get two. I get one from the archer, and that is it. So that's another five points. So I'm up to 10 now. Next is zombie wave. So I get 10 points for each zombie wave that I completed, which means I've killed one of each one of these zombies in a wave. So let's go just down the chart. So I got six of the solos, three archers, three masters, and two pandas. So the best I can do is do two full completions. So I'll get another 10 points for, or 20 points for that. So I'm up to 30 points. Next, I'm going to receive points by the number of defeated ninja of each type. So with the solo ninja, I'm going to get two points for each one of those. and I've killed six, so I'll receive 12 points for that. Next, the archers are going to give me three points apiece. So I've killed three of those, so I will receive nine points for that. So I will get another 10 points there. On to the Masters, they are worth 5 points apiece, so I got 15 points for that. And that will bump me up to 60. So obviously I've done super well in this, of course, you know how that is. And then finally we get 8 points per Panda, so that's another 16 points for that. And there we go. Oop. And then I'll total all those up. So I have 60, 70, 82. So then I'll control, consult my chart. And anything over 65 is immortal standings. So of course, this is just an example of that. I would love to have done that well. Normally this game is very brutal. So if you get anywhere near immortal, you are doing fantastic. Well, I hope you found this video helpful. If you have any questions or comments, leave those in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer them. And as always, thank you so much for taking the time to watch my videos and leave me feedback on them. I do really appreciate it and take into account everything you say to make the best possible videos. Until next time, I'll see you later.